Good morning everyone. I'm playing with some stuff again. No, it's no chunk. Definitely not. What is it? Maybe if you know what it is, it looks familiar, but I doubt that most of you will know what it is. So I give you a little hint. It's a Revox device. And to be a bit more uh, precisely, it's a Revox G36 tape recorder. And for those who don't know what Revox is, Revox is one of a few Swiss manufacturers of uh, electronic devices, especially music electronic. And uh, it's a spin-off of the Studer company that makes professional studio equipment and stuff. And Revox was the brand for consumer electronics. So the Revox G36 came out in the year 1963 and was produced until 1967. And it was the last a uh, unit with vacuum tubes or valves as other ones call it um, and it was the best uh, tape recorder you can you could get in those times the price in 1963 was 1295 swiss francs which is in today's money about four and a half thousand Swiss francs or American dollars, which is almost the same at the moment. Okay, before we start to have a look inside, I want to show you all the accessories that came with it. So first you have space for really large spools of tape, one on the left side, and another one on the right side for the empty spool. But even more exciting is what came uh, here as accessories, as uh, books and information about uh, the tape. And well, as you see, there is quite a lot of documents coming with that uh, machine. and. That was amazing me the most. All the documents looked like they were brand new. Like nobody has ever had a look inside or maybe once and then stored it carefully. For example, this one. It's the original size poster of the whole unit. Something you get in advance to be excited about the product you probably buy for Christmas 1963 or whatever. And yes, it's exactly the size of the unit. It's a couple of millimeters less, but we don't judge that. Then another interesting brochure is this uh, accessories price list. You also see the price of the unit, 1,295 Swiss francs. In the model that I have with the uh, case around it, or you could have only the chassis without the case to build in in, a, in whatever your own custom box. And it was 1,220, it was, well, 70 francs less. So let's see what else we have. We have microphones, 220 francs, 295 francs. And for example, that microphone here for 580 francs. It's a ribbon microphone. They are expensive anyway. 580, that's almost half the price of the recorder so 
uh, you can calculate it multiplied by three and a half and you get today's price. So that was, well, a $2,000 microphone today. Then we had a pair of microphones here for 195, one for 100, that's quite cheap. Then we have uh, sound transformers for different microphone. We have statives. Is that the correct English word? I don't know. They have no price. They have prices, okay. They go from $84 or Swiss francs to, well, $137. Then we have microphone holders, all kind of headphones, $217, quite an expensive one for the day. Small headphones, single earphones and microphone headphone combination for 160. Then we have a little box with two regulators. Oh, that's a, a simple sound level adjustment box. And we have something that looks like a shower head. And that's not a shower head, that's a headphone for one ear. You hold it in your hand and you can listen to music. And where they used it, it was in, uh, in Grammo bars. Maybe you don't know that expression. That was a shop where you could uh, buy records, music. And if you want to buy records, you could listen to them first to see if you like it or not. And they had this style of... Uh, uh, loudspeaker because i don't know maybe of hygienic reasons you can you could swap out this discussion here or uh, just to prevent people to sit too long on that bar listen to the entire long play record or i don't know they were quite popular sometimes you could even have two of them one for each ear, so you could also hear stereo. Then, remote controls. Yeah, that's a foot pedal and that's a switch for uh, to operate by hand. So they are basically on-off switches. When you place your recorder in record mode, you could record or not with a remote control switch. Then, we have the slide o -matic. Where is it? Is it on camera? Yes. slide o is something to control your slide projector here, your slide uh, viewer. And the trick was to record music or voice on one track and a specialized, a special uh, switching signal, which was normally a one or two kilohertz tone that was uh, received by this unit here and then you could plug in your uh, slide viewer and then uh, it advanced one picture when it received the, the signal. So it was quite popular in the times when automatic slideshows were in. Today of course you do that on your computer, you place music, you make a video anyway, not a slideshow. Yeah. Speakers. Goodman's Maxim. Never heard of that. 270 francs. Quite an expensive one. Even more expensive, this box here that looks like a, a shoe carton box. 355. Okay, then we have a protective cover for the tape recorder for 50 francs. And we have a transport trolley, the Farboy, 
4 means drive, the drive boy, two wheels for 99 francs. That was quite a useful device because the tape here weighs 22 kilos. Yes, it has a handle, but it's quite heavy to move around. And then we have the four boy with four wheels, maybe for shul rooms or, well, studios, whatever. 185 francs. And, of course, printed in Switzerland and probably 66 could be the year when this was printed. Okay. What else do we have? We have a round disc. That's also an interesting thing. That's more or less like a slide rule. Here you can set the minutes of play or record you want. Let's say you want to record 20 minutes. Then you need at 4.75 centimeters per second, you need a 60 or 70 meter tape, that's tape length in meters. Uh, yes, if you want to record in nine and a half centimeters per second, you need a 130, 140 meter tape. And if you want to use the highest speed, 19 centimeter per second, you need a 270 to 300 meter tape. If you want to record one hour, yes, you also get the tapes here, 730 meters for 19 centimeter per second. And if you want to record for two hours, the last field here is empty because the longest tape available from BASF, a German company that produced magnetic tapes. The longest tape was probably 730 meters. There was no longer tape, so it was not possible to record two hours at that speed. And if you want to record three hours, then even that field here gets empty. So that was only possible in 4.75 centimeters, you already needed the 700 meter tape. And if you want to record four hours, that was possible with the 730 meter tapes. And that was it. Well, four hours of recording time was not bad. What is it? With this band clock, they call it a band clock. Uh, they want to give a, a helping tool for all the friends of magnetophone band BASF. And it informs you about uh, speed and times and yeah, exactly that's what this does. Okay, what else? What is this? Okay, that's something like an information brochure for the technical things. That's the mechanics. We have three motors. This one is the capstan motor that determines the, the band, uh, the speed of the tape. And the pickup and uh, well, this, the spool motors. Uh, the capstan motor was a synchronous motor that runs perfectly synchronous with the 50 Hz mains frequency. Uh, if you wanted to use it in, a, in America, for example, with 60 Hz, I don't know, there was something... I think you could switch it or maybe you had to replace the motor because, well, it was a 220 volt motor anyway, so I think. Or do we have a transformer for it? Don't know. So, that's the whole electronics. It's a piece of art by itself. 
Then we have all the tape heads mounted on a cast aluminium frame. Yeah, and that was the dealer that sold it in this time. And you can also see there is no spot, there is no yellowing of the paper and it is a very strange paper, it has a structure on it and it, of course it looks like new, never used before. So that's another uh, user manual for the slide o -matic. Unfortunately I don't have that, but I also don't need that. And if you are interested there is the schematic diagram. And this is how it is connected to the tape recorder. So I think one of the transistors, yes, there is a coder switch. That's an oscillator that produces that sound to record it on the tape recorder. And the other transistor is that circuit that listens to that sound and clicks the relay that goes to the uh, slide projector. And then we have this here, that's the original user manual for the G36. With a lot of pictures, how mono and stereo tracks are arranged. So the G36 is stereo, the models before have only been mono. So that's all kind of connectors on the back. That's the numbers, what, what they are. Yeah, it's a description of every single button of this device. How you connect it, that's the original uh, amplifier of the time with the original Revox box speaker. And yes, there were, was an internal speaker, but only one. And if you wanted stereo, you could hook up the second speaker here with banana plugs. That was state of the art. We have view meters. The earlier models had a, a tube, uh, a magic eye tube with this green uh, display you probably know from old radios. There's a block diagram. It's all pretty simple and basic, but still very sophisticated for the time. Okay, let's go to the unit itself. We are looking at the bottom cover right now and I already removed three screws and that's the fourth screw and that reveals all the beauty inside. Well it's really, it is clean, it is well designed, it is, well you normally don't see stuff like that and even if you have old tube devices most of the time they don't look as clean as that one. Then one thing I noticed, all the potentiometers are down here, but the, uh, the knobs are on the other side, so they have a long axis going, uh, a long shaft, sorry, a long shaft going from here to here. And the reason for that is simple to keep the all the wires as short as possible because the electronics is here and of course the potentiometers are also here. Then on this side here you can see the part of the big loudspeaker. It has about this size here. Maybe you can see it a little bit through that grill here. So it's a decent size of loudspeaker. Here you see the, the back side of it. Uh, let's see if we can take that out of the case. Yes. Well, uh, of course we can, but I still don't know how. Okay, let's go.
I just noticed another interesting feature here. The whole chassis here is mounted on spring shock absorbers because, well, I was wondering what these two wood blocks here, uh, what they are, what function they have. And they are simply made to limit the travel here of this chassis. But it's only the electronic chassis, there are the mechanical parts, the motors, they are uh, mounted on a fixed chassis. And the reason for that is pretty clever because vacuum tubes here, they can pick up mechanical uh, vibrations, turn it into uh, electrical signals and at the end into a noise sound that we don't want. And with this uh, mechanism here, they uh, prevented that. Well, I like that. Okay, and that's how it looks without the color. We have, again, some interesting details. For example, oh, blah. that was the top color, no problem. Um, here we have a light bulb going through that light guide here over to this post here which has a, a light sensor inside. Normally the tape goes between these two things here to the other slot and it blocks the light and the sensor is dark and everything runs like uh, you want. So then you want to wind it back and when the tape unwinds from the, from the spool and flaps around in the breeze, this sensor here gets the light from the right bulb and everything stops. So that's what it does. It's an automatic stop at the end of the tape. You may also notice that the mechanics is pretty simple. We have uh, direct drive motors, one for the pickup, one for the supply reel. And these motors have a mechanical brake here, which is actuated by that lever here. It's a solenoid down there. It actuates both brakes in the same time. And when it is released, the motors here are spinning freely. And when the brake is engaged, well, they are braked. So that's pretty important because if a tape spool in the size of this gets on full speed, you need good brakes to stop it. Another reason why this looks so empty is normally in the tape recorder you have all kinds of gears and uh, belts and rubber wheels and stuff. And here we have three independent motors. Here is the other one with the capstan uh, shaft. And that's the reason why we don't need any mechanical uh, devices, because everything is driven directly by an electric motor. So makes the mechanic quite simple. So I hope I can remove that from the chassis without cutting my fingers or something. Oh, I think I know where it is jammed. Nope, I have to unplug that first. Oops.
there is the cover for um, well all the connections and the mains cable here is attached to the device and you can use the external uh, speaker connection to store the plug quite interesting okay let's try it again maybe it's better to put it that way or maybe don't know if that is clever if I oh, it's heavy maybe it's better to go like that yes that's it now we have that stupid cable Okay, did I say it is heavy? Yes, still 20 kilos. Ah, okay. So that with the cable was not the best idea to have it fixed on the device, but that was the time when that was all right. Well then, that was my fitness exercise for today. Moving heavy tape recorders. We also have PCBs, which is quite or extraordinary for a device of that time, because most of the circuits are looking like that, with no PCB at all. So we also have a huge motor here. You can see it's my hand in comparison. That's a huge motor that only drives the capstan shaft. Where is it? That's the rubber roller that presses against the tape. I see some rusty spots here. Okay, that's funny because everything is aluminium, so I think it's some sort of, well, foam rubber that has disappeared. There is a cover for the tape head uh, that uh, protects the head from magnetic uh, noise from the outside tape goes between that cover and the head. Then we have solenoids. Ah, that's the solenoid to release the keys here when it stops automatically. We have a big switch that could be, yes, that's the power switch which is actuated from the front here. Nice clunky switch, no problems with that. We have capacitors, probably some for the motors, maybe that one. That's one of the motors. You see that bell-shaped rotor around that the winding here. So it's 125 volt 220 volt so the motor is and it needs three and a half microfarad so the motor is made for 125 and 220 volts so no problem to use that motor in the US for example uh, what do we have here that's the panel with all the connections we have a voltage selector switch so no problem we don't need to uh, change any components if we, we simply change the voltage here to 40 that's England UK in that time 
Now we are all on 230, so UK went 10 volts down, Europe went 10 volts up and we met each other at 230 volts. So no changes had to be done or no major changes. That's the remote control plug. And if we remove that here, our tape won't work anymore because there is a connection bridge inside. And if you remove that, you have to put in the remote switch and then you can turn your unit on or off. Or you can turn it to pause or record. Okay, let's have a look a little bit closer on the tape heads. Here you see the capstan shaft that actually drives the tape. That's the rubber roller that clamps the tape to that shaft. We have the, let me see, record head, playback head and the erase head. The reason why I know this is the tape runs in this direction and the record head is always first because with the uh, read head or the playback head you can then check the signal if everything is okay. So you can listen the sound that you just recorded here when the tape goes that way. And of course the erase head is the first, because if you want to overwrite that tape you have to erase it first, record the new music or whatever, and then play it back to hear if everything is alright, because you have to set the, the record level and uh, yeah, the correct speed. Well, the speed doesn't matter in that case, but yeah, that's why it has three heads. When I said that the electronic part here is on rubber mounts, that's not true. It's just a relatively flexible uh, piece of, well, it's steel. One here, one here, and it is mounted here. So we have three points and all those can move a little bit. And I think they made that on purpose for the reason, as I said, to uh, remove any vibrations from the mechanic. I also need to show you the inside of the case because that already looks like a piece of flight equipment. We have a strong aluminium frame, it's cast aluminium. One, two, three, four, eight screws to the chassis. That grid is only some kind of plastic, paper, carton, whatever. And the chassis is mounted here. And well, the, the back cover is attached here. So everything, the whole mechanic, the whole, all the covers, everything is on this and on that frame, which is identical. So I think that's a pretty nice view here. I put it back together and then we will talk a little bit about vacuum tubes. And I think it's much easier to gently flip the tape drive upside down. You have to be careful not to bend anything on the top side. And then you simply slide the light case over the heavy device, which is much simpler than the other way around. That's also funny, I realized that right now that's two buttons for the higher and the lower tape speed. 
and in the user manual they write it's nine and a half and 19 centimeter per second but if you look at this it's three uh, how much three quarters and seven and a half that's inch per second so they already have adapted this device to the American market which was a big market where they sold many of these units uh, the problem is they forgot to mention that in the user manual so but because it's only two speed well it's relatively clear what is meant low speed high speed that's it well I almost forgot to show you how this thing actually works I mean that's the most important thing so the first I had to make some adapters here because there are no large spools with small holes so I have to do that myself okay that's it holding firmly then of course you need to find the beginning of the tape then you go over that then through this slot here then over the other uh, guide and then you feed that tape in and I just don't know if it's really that tape here because the tape looks rather old okay we will see so we have a couple of turns that's okay we turn it on that's first I had to find out how to turn it on because the on off switch is here and when the unit is off there is of course no light you don't see the off sign here in that window then we need a little bit amplitude seven and a half speed that's 19 centimeters per second uh, record we don't need the record settings let's play that that's the play button stop clear okay I have to stop that before YouTube gets my audio track recognized um, that was the quality of the internal speaker it's well you can hear that something is on the tape but of course it sounds much much better when it's connected to a real stereo set and uh, good quality speakers and uh, yeah I would say at 19 centimeters per second it almost has the quality of a digital recording of a CD or something like that yeah let's go fast forward and you will see the tape speed is quite extraordinary here especially when that reel here gets full and that gets empty so the speed increases more and more let's see if the brakes are working it takes a while but yes they work <laughs> What a dramatic scene here. It's, it's the soundtrack of The Thief of Baghdad, one of my favorite movies. Uh, let's rewind that.
and check if the automatic stop here with the light sensor is working. I know that it does, but I want to show you how it's working. So as I said, the rewind or force fast forward speed is quite amazing. In fact, almost dangerous and it stops. And you see the heavy reel here takes longer to stop, which is logic. Okay, stop. Yeah, turn it off. So that's the tubes or valves or vacuum tubes, radio tubes. They have a lot of names and some people say so and some say otherwise. But before we start watching these things, we have to look at something different. At the light bulb that Edison invented. So this light bulb with a single filament started all that radio tube madness and well it was a man named John Ambrose Fleming who had a brilliant idea and that's how he looked and here you can see his first prototypes of the valves he created he took a standard light bulb and added a wire and made it a little bit more complicated to get better results and how it works i will show you right now let's start at the beginning edison invented the light bulb that's that thing here more or less and that's why this thread here is called E27, E like Edison, it's 27 millimeters. Okay, Fleming had an idea. I don't know how he got to that idea, but he added another wire to that light bulb, fused it through the glass, because probably he thought that electrons maybe forming a cloud around this filament wire here because of the tremendous heat I mean it's white glowing uh, it's about 2700 uh, degrees Celsius about like that or near to 3000 degrees and if you're apply a positive uh, charge to that wire the electrons will start to move towards that wire because they are attracted because electrons have a negative charge A positive charge here means nothing else that we are drawing away some electrons. Somehow we have less electrons on the wire and the wire gets positively charged, which attracts the negative electrons. And it turned out that this actu actually worked. So we have here the heater. In this case we have 230 volt AC. Of course if you want to use that tube for uh, radio applications we need another heater so most of the tubes are 6.3 volt. Some are heated with DC and some are heated with AC. So we have here, let's say, a 6.3 volt battery that heats up this wire. Then we need 
another battery which is connected like that uh, let me do it right we have minus we have plus here to that wire here and we will find that a current is flowing in that direction respectively the electrons are flowing that direction let's make that so electrons go that way but the current that's a definition of the current is going that way current goes from positive to negative that's probably a misconception of the time when they started to experiment with currents they found that something is flowing from plus to minus they didn't have any idea about electrons and so okay that's it current goes from plus to minus electrons go the op other side around because they are negative charged or because some guy in the old days simply got it wrong okay but what happens if we change the polarity of that battery minus plus what happens is this if we have the minus uh, contact to that wire that wire will become negative charged it will be filled up with electrons but the problem is because that wire is cold the electrons cannot leave it only the electrons on the hot uh, cathode can leave the wire and travel through the empty space here inside the glass so we have at the end a device somehow like that where electrons can travel that way but they cannot travel that way and any device where uh, current can travel only in one way is called a diode and that's exactly what this is that's a valve or tube diode diode there is the word di inside which means which means two out probably from electrode yes we have one electrode the heated and one electrode the cold two electrode diode okay so we have now something like that and to improve the entire situation we could not only take a piece of wire but we take a tube around that heater that collects more electrons of course because they are spread all over the place in all directions so a tube is a much better anode then a little bit later they found that the cathode it's not really practical when it is the same electrode as the heater so they put another tube around that with insulation between that especially thermal insulation and we have a new cathode which is indirectly heated by the heating coil or the heating wire so we have a heater we have a cathode we have an anode 
the function is still the same as in the old light bulb configuration, that's still a diode. Let's go a little bit into the schematics. Let's say that's the heater, that's our cathode. Electrons will be spit out in the vacuum of the room. And here at the other end we have an anode which is positively charged that attracts the electrons. Now the next step is to add something in between, like a little grid, maybe like that. Don't know how the first grids, if the grid is, or let it call the gate, no, let it call the grid, because that's the correct term, grid. If the grid is not connected, electrons just travel through it, go to the anode and we have a current and we have the diode effect that electrons cannot travel back from the anode to the cathode. But if we give that grid, now let me think, a positive charge, no, a negative charge, then electrons are repelled from it and they can't travel through that grid to the anode. So in fact we have created a valve, an, ele an electron valve, something that cuts off the, uh, the current of electrons, the flow of electrons, and that's where the, uh, the term valve, the name valve comes from. Tube, well, it's obvious, it looks like a tube, a tube of glass with some stuff inside. And because we have now one, two and three electrodes, this would be a triode, tri-electrode, however they combine that. And that's the very first and simplest method of controlling current with an electronic device, just like a transistor. You need a small current, or in this uh, configuration, a small voltage to uh, influence the current between anode and cathode. And well, that's in fact how tubes work. So I don't want to get in more details, but I think for the first moment it should be clear how that stuff works. And uh, if you want to know it a little bit in more details, there are tons of articles about that. Okay, thanks for watching.